A Mexican mom doesn't give statistics. She doesn't give facts. She'll just give examples. <laughs> you're gonna end up like your cousin Lupe. <laughs> so I have six kids, five boys, one girl. Yeah. My daughter is my daughter is 15. She's beautiful, straight A student, made varsity cheerleader as a sophomore. The boys are knocking at the door now. What's the right age to let her die? To date, let her date. 16? No, I don't like you. I need a dad. Dad, what's the right age to let my daughter date? There's not, yeah, that's a good answer. There's not a right age. I told her 33. I said, Jesus never went on a date. If you outlive the Lord, My dad was a preacher, and I found out at 12 years old, it didn't pay to be funny. My, my dad would go from church to church preaching, and I always take one of us kids with him, and I'm sitting in the front row of this big church, 500 people on a Sunday morning, and before my dad starts to preach, he surprises me. Mijo, stand up and tell the church something about yourself. I'm 12. I'm scared. I got a good life. I live at home with my mom and dad. What, is, what am I going to testify about? But I stood up and my sense of humor kicked in. <laughs> and I faced the congregation and said, my name is Dennis. And I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, wrong group. <laughs> Good joke for the dry bar. <laughs> Everybody thinks if you grow up in a preacher's home, in a good home, everything's perfect. No, my mom and dad would get into disagreements. But if my mom got upset, my mom was half Mexican, half Puerto Rican. My dad never wanted to lose his temper when he was having to deal with my mom. One morning, it was Saturday, we were going fishing. Early in the morning, and my mom started getting on my dad's case about getting some chores done around the house. And whenever he got upset, he would just throw out a scripture or a biblical principle. Do not try this at home. <laughs> when she started getting on his case, he looked at her and said, ye without sin cast the first stone. That's the wrong thing to say to a half Mexican, half Puerto Rican woman. When he said, ye without sin, cast the first stone, she was like, Jesus is my rock, I'm sanctified, and busted him upside the head. <laughs> I got more jokes, I'm just looking at you guys. <laughs> We parent different. I don't buy into the politically correct mentality that we're all the same. Who's tired of the whole politically correct mentality where you can't? You know? If you want to see politically correct comedy, you need to go see a non-smoking, drug-free, vegetarian, bisexual, handicapped, Native American, senior citizen, female that drives her electric car to her job at the recycling plant. I'm not the one. <laughs> we do things different. I don't buy into the hype, we're all the same. To say that we're all the same, we're all equal, but to say we're all the same denies God's creation as far as I'm concerned. He knew what he was doing, he made us all a little bit different. Look how we parent. Each ethnic group does it a little bit different. No one gives better parental advice than my white brothers and sisters. You guys give statistics and facts. <laughs> You guys have flyers on the refrigerator. It's beautiful. <laughs> Just say no, Billy. <laughs> A Mexican mom doesn't give statistics. She doesn't give facts. She'll just give examples. <laughs> You're gonna end up like your cousin Lupe. So 
some cultures you could talk back to your mom. If you grew up in a Latino home, you cannot talk back to your mother. You let your kids talk back to you? They talk back to you? And you let them live? I mean, you let them get away with it? <laughs> I remember I thought I was old enough to talk back to my mom. She whooped me and grounded me for two weeks. Had to call my wife, let her know I couldn't come home. <laughs> Baby mom is tripping. <laughs> nice crowd. So I recently turned 40, like, like you 10 years ago, and um, over 40, wave a hand. If you're over 40, wave a hand. Okay. Now, if you're not 40, you're going to think this is a joke. But if you're over 40, you know I'm telling the truth. Because you start going through things when you cross 40 that you don't go through in your 30s and 20s. A couple weeks ago, I got hurt sleeping. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Not jumping out of bed while I slept. I pulled a muscle. And I'm limping around my house the whole day. I didn't know what happened. I couldn't remember. Then, I, then, then it hit me that I got that cramp. Who gets the cramp in the middle of the night? The cramp in the calf. <laughs> Came time for me to take my nap, but I was scared. <laughs> so I'm not in good enough shape to sleep. <laughs> so, of course, I made that New Year's resolution to work out. I went to the doctor though, and I said, you know, I want a workout plan. He told me to start with 25 crunches a day. I said, man, that's a lot of chocolate. But, uh... <laughs> I'm up to 12 bars a day, man. <laughs> I'm feeling better, but my diabetes is out of control right now. <laughs> I wore black tonight, ladies know that secret. Black makes you look thinner. I think it's true, because I often see chubby white women with black boyfriends. <laughs> Just seen how far I could go with you guys, huh? Don't go too far, Paco. <laughs> Now, this is small for Latino standards, but this is the biggest I've ever been. I was the runt of a high school of 3,000 kids. I went to Berkeley High. I was five foot two and 75 pounds my freshman year. I was, now I'm almost 200. And I went to a family party and my cousin walks up to me and he slaps me on my stump and goes, what happened? I said, I got older. I said, but you were fat when we were 12. <laughs> I'm just glad they didn't have that booster seat law back then. Can you imagine me going to the prom? I'd be like all buckled up, you know. You're beautiful. Let me out, mom. So I've been married 21 years. Thank you. Thank you. Three wives, three wives, but uh, I'm good at it, man. <laughs> I just did a show with a couple that had been married for 62 years. And I asked them right from the stage, say, how have you stayed married that long? And the husband said, we haven't spoke since Vietnam. <laughs> Now, I just remarried my first wife. After 23 years apart, we got remarried, and I had to go see the counselor at church to find out, you know, he wanted to know why we wanted to get remarried. I said, because I miss half my stuff. <laughs> no, the hardest part about breaking up, because we were childhood sweethearts, and then we broke up, the hardest part was the custody battle. We were right there in court arguing, you take them, no, you take them. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, the rest of you are praying. Like, mm. 
So I just finished a 12 base tour for the Air Force. They sent me out to do 12 shows across the country for the Air Force. It was awesome going back and performing. I was in the Air Force myself, so it was awesome to go back. Let me, let me do a check right here through how many military veterans we have tonight. Clap your hands if you're military veterans. Woo! All right. Go vets. Go vets. Okay, let's do a room check. Where are the Army veterans at? Army. Woo! Give it up for the Army over there and back over here. Marine Corps, where are the Marines at? Any Marines here? No, 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 everybody stay still. What, watch, once a Marine? Always a Marine. They don't know when the war ends. I have no Marine jokes. <laughs> Where's the Navy at? Anybody from the Navy? Anybody serving the Navy? Anybody shop at Old Navy? <laughs> An Air Force, who's in the Air Force with me? Right over here, give it up, my brother over here. We were this close to being in the military. <laughs> you don't realize how tough you aren't when you're in the Air Force until you get out and you have to go to the VA to be with all the other veterans. I see a Marine limp by, he goes, Vietnam took a bullet. I see an Army soldier go by, Gulf War, shrap metal. I'm standing there with the wrist brace. <laughs> But I still wanted to act like I was tough. I was like, U.S. Air Force, carpal tunnel, email, 05. <laughs> I'm better now, I'm better now. <laughs> so I go out in these 12, 12 Air Force bases. One of the bases was so far into Texas that the nearest airport was in Mexico. They said we could fly to Mexico or drive six hours across Texas to go to this base. I said, I'm not flying into Mexico. I know who won the election. You're not getting rid of me like that. <laughs> so we drove from San Antonio to a base all the way out by the border. And an hour away from the base, we get stopped by an immigration checkpoint. Me and two other comedians, I'm driving the rental car. And I pull over at an immigration checkpoint. And I quote the immigration officer. He walks up to the car and says, are you a Jewish citizen? It's like, are you a Jewish citizen? And then we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when we were performing at a base. When we got there, they briefed us about how top secret this base was but they had the hot air balloon festival going on and hot air balloons were accidentally floating over the base and landing. And I witnessed this and the military police were very nice. They just escorted them right off the base. I saw this happen and I called my uncle in Mexico. I said, there's a new way to get in. <laughs> they can't build a wall big enough for this one. Oh, that would make him mad, huh? If we had hot air balloons. What do you mean they're floating over the wall? <laughs> We're gonna tax the air. We're gonna tax the air. <laughs> I'm not left wing, I'm not right wing, you know. I get my political views from my grandfather, a very wise old man from Torreon, Mexico. I went up to my grandpa one day and said, Grandpa, what do you think about a woman's right to choose? He said, mijo, I think everyone should wear shoes. <laughs> I grew up poor. I'm not ashamed to say I grew up poor. Anybody grow up poor? Nothing wrong with growing up in poverty. You learn things when you're poor that you would not know if you had money. When I was seven years old, the family car was a 1965 Chevy Impala that was not a lowrider on purpose. <laughs> we had a big family and a hoopty, man. Who knows something about a hoopty? Used to call it a jalopy, they call it a hoopty now. This car had no reverse, because the transmission was messed up. You couldn't make a left turn because the steering column was messed up. You cannot make up jokes like this, all right? This is a testimony right now. 
I was seven years old when we had this hoopty you couldn't even make a left turn in. But at the age of seven, I already knew that three rights equal to left. <laughs> Rich kids didn't know that. <laughs> my teachers thought I was advanced. <laughs> you don't want to ask my dad for directions. He'd be like, okay, man, you make a right. You make a right. You make a right. You'll be all right. <laughs> we were poor for dinner. All we had was helper. No hamburger, just, just the helper. <laughs> you know, it's hard to travel. You know that, right? It's hard to travel and be a good person. Anybody experience that? Where you're trying your best to be nice and friendly, but the flight in today, I'm on the window seat. The plane was packed, and it's not the man's fault. He's a big man. The seat is little, but he had to sit right next to me. And he's pouring into my seat. It's not his fault. <laughs> but before we even get in the air, he falls asleep. And by the time we're up in the air, he's snoring, and his head is on my shoulder. He's dead asleep. And I start elbowing him to get, me, get him off of me. And then I heard in my heart, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Man, I didn't know Jesus flew southwest. <laughs> Kept hearing, what would Jesus do? Then I thought about it. I was like, Man, Jesus raised the dead. So I looked at him and said, Wake up! <laughs> Got up. <laughs> I do all these jokes about being Mexican, and I'm, I'm, I'm a grandpa. Where are the grandpas at? Where are the grandfathers at? You, got grand, you have, you have gr grandsons from your son or from your daughter? From your son. They're going to carry your name on. <laughs> I have two grandsons. My second son gave me two grandsons. But his wife is Irish Italian. I got Nico and Nolan. They got my last name. But they're blue eyed, freckle faced little boys. <laughs> I can't even take them to the mall by myself without an Amber Alert going off. <laughs> An impression for you guys. I, I can't do characters or other people, you know. I got a high-pitched, squeaky voice. I know that. I still get called ma'am on the phone. <laughs> I called my friend up. My friend's named Jeff. Jeff happens to be black. His daughter answered the phone. I said, can I speak to Jeff? She said, hold on, Grandma. <laughs> so either I sound like a little old black lady. <laughs> Uh, Jeff's mom sounds like a little Mexican comedian. <laughs> but I'm working on a new impression. I'm going to debut it for this special right here. I don't know if you guys are ready for this one. <clears throat> this is my impression of a Latino proposal. <clears throat> are you going to keep it? <laughs> Thank you. You guys were, some of you were laughing, some of you were doing signs of the cross, you guys like. <laughs> All right, same joke with a different twist. This is my impression of a black proposal. <clears throat> In the case of 18-month-old Jamil, you are the father. <laughs> ah! I told you, I told you. <laughs> You can spell it both ways. <laughs> All right, one more impression for you guys. This one almost got me beat up. This is not about the friendly, kind, compassionate, loving 
God-fearing people of Provo, Utah. <laughs> I was two hours north of Sacramento, California at a Native American casino. One night a month, they do comedy there. 700 cowboys, no Indians. <laughs> I did the Latino proposal, they laughed. I did the black proposal, they laughed. So I thought these were some really cool good old boys. And I did this impression. Once again, this is not about the friendly people that are here tonight. <laughs> this is my impression of a redneck proposal. <clears throat> Don't tell Ma. <laughs> <laughs> 700 people, nobody laughed. <laughs> the dude sitting right next to the stage jumps up and goes, that ain't funny. <laughs> and he wants to fight me. I was like, bro, sit down, man. He's about my age. I said, man, we'll have a heart attack before we land a punch. Just sit down. <laughs> but he keeps going and security came and they grabbed him and they're taking him out of the theater and he goes, I'll see you after the show. He just threatened me. But I still have to be funny. So I said the first thing that came to my mind, I was like, well, how are you going to catch me? I'm in a Mercedes. You have a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what security was like. That's enough, Paco. <laughs> How'd I turn into Paco all of a sudden? <laughs> There are all these jokes about being Mexican and I'm not fluent in Spanish. <clears throat> I was at a show and I mentioned that one time and this lady, that's like a big insult in the Latino cultures. If you're not fluent, you're fluent in Spanish. But if you don't, huh, they get mad at you. And this lady said, oh, you're a sellout. You're not a real Mexican. I said, oh yeah, here's how Mexican I am. My youngest son, when he was born, he was already an uncle. <laughs> You don't get any more beaner than that right there. Okay. <laughs> People get nervous when you joke about race, act like race is the biggest problem in America. I think that's the media. The media wants to divide us. I travel around the country, go to rooms of all different colors of people, and we all laugh together. The media does a really good job acting like we can't get along. We have problems, but our problems are nothing compared to other parts of the world where they hate each other so much, they'll put a bomb on their own body to kill themselves and their enemies over ethnic and religious differences. You'll never see that in America. You'll never see a redneck get on a bus in Oakland, California and go, in the name of the KKK. <laughs> All right, white men, don't cross your arms on that joke right there. Huh? <laughs> I have a real mixed family. I got a black brother-in-law, Jewish brother-in-law, Puerto Rican sister-in-law. My wife's Puerto Rican, you know. But not all the combinations work out perfectly, you know. My nephew's Mexican and Jewish. He wants to get a car, but he's not sure if he should steal it or buy it wholesale. <laughs> He plays soccer, man. He, and he, he goes to an inner city school in California. He's the only player. I go to one game because his dad is sick, so I go to the game with him. The uncle will be there with you. Two soccer teams. He's the only kid on the field that is not 100% Mexican. And he's getting ready to go in the game, and he's stretching. And I try to make him laugh and relax. So I go up to the fence, and I yell, Jew can do it. <laughs> One of the parents sitting behind me goes, Yes, you can.
I don't speak Spanish, like I said. I, I, I'm still proud of my culture. Nothing wrong. Everybody should be proud of their own culture. There's nothing wrong with having some tribal pride, all right? I have those moments where it just burst out of me. Like, for my birthday last year, my sister gave me a card to Starbucks. I don't even drink coffee that much. But I went, and nobody in Starbucks, and there was a long line, nobody was ordering coffee. Everybody was ordering fancy drinks. And I felt so out of place. And the lady right in front of me, when it was her turn, she ordered a soy vanilla latte. Now it's my turn to order, and I'm looking at the menu, and I'm nervous. And I saw they had a spicy mocha. So I was like, let me get a soy spicy mocha. Then when they called my drink at the end of the coffee bar, the girl was like, soy spicy mocha. And I had a burst of Latino pride, and I was like, soy mexicano. <laughs> You're not laughing, you didn't pay attention in Spanish class. <laughs> I'm trying to grow my beard because I think I look lo more like my dad. But my mom was like, you look like your grandma. <laughs> you met her? You know, sitting there. <laughs> I get my sense of humor from my mom. My mom was funny, didn't even know she was funny. You know anybody like that? They're just naturally funny. They don't try to be funny. For my mom's birthday a few years ago, we took her to dinner, and then we took her to see the movie Passion of the Christ. How many people saw the movie Passion of the Christ? Okay, some of you did. I, I don't want to ruin the ending. <laughs> mm. He doesn't make it. <laughs> Three days later, sequel. <laughs> we took my mom to see Passion of the Christ and we got kicked out the theater. <laughs> you know how hard it is to get kicked out of a movie when it's a good, clean, wholesome movie? We got kicked out because through the whole movie, my mom was screaming, run, Jesus, run! <laughs> Don't get churchy on me. Right? That's, that's, that's a good joke. <laughs> so how many years married? 15. 15. Anybody got 15 beat? Who's got more than 15? 20. Anybody got 30? Any, 30? 30, right? How many, sir? 45. Give them a round of applause. 45 years. To all the married couples, especially to the women, I want to help you out. This lie that goes around that says men don't communicate. Ladies, we communicate. <laughs> Just not with you. Because <laughs> we know if we say the wrong thing, it doesn't ruin that moment. It could ruin a whole period of time. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. I had a golf trip planned with my uncle and cousins. We were going to go to Monterey, California, just three hours away. Had this trip planned for two weeks. I didn't tell my wife I was going golfing until the morning that I snuck out of bed very quietly. <laughs> got dressed, got washed up, came back to the room, gave her a kiss on the forehead and said, okay, I'm going golfing. And she woke her up, well, when'd you plan this? I said, two weeks ago. <laughs> You're barely telling me now? Why have you mad for two weeks? <laughs> love you. <laughs> Never forget, ladies, that that man you're married to is nothing but a big boy, all right? Don't kill the little boy in your man, all right? If he likes to play video games, don't get upset. You play video games, sir, still? She said no. He looked at her like sad. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right, sir? <laughs> Just blink and we'll get you in a shelter tonight, sir. Just... <laughs> he looked like a 12-year-old boy that was grounded right there. He looked at her, he's like. 
I play video games. I, st- I still eat cereal. Where are the men that eat cereal still? Uh, I go to bed with a bowl of cereal. I start my day with a bowl of life, and I finish it with a bowl of life. And there's a plan behind that. I eat life cereal every day just in case something happens to me. Everybody can go, he was so full of life. (laughs) That's the dumbest joke I ever wrote. (laughs) I got a trophy wife too, man. I know that's not right to say, refer to my wife as a trophy, but I'm proud of my, everybody, if you're in love, that's your trophy. As your husband and your wife, that's that's your trophy. But not everybody got a first place trophy. (laughs) You got a first place trophy, sir, look at you. You put your arm around her, you're like, well, I win. (laughs) She got a plaque, but you got a trophy. (laughs) Well, shout out to my two black brother and sister in the back there, all right? I asked where the black community was in Provo, and they said, they'll be at the show tonight. You don't understand how, how different it is. I grew up in Berkeley, California in a melting pot. It's a global melting pot of people from all around the world, you know, and the most racist thing I ever experienced as a kid wasn't from a white person. It was from a black guy and he was my friend. And this was back before people had start having their feelings on Facebook. I went to school with a kid named Kenny, and for eight years, from junior high through high school, every day, Kenny called me Taco. (laughs) I'm glad you think that's funny, (laughs) ma'am. He would see me, and I would walk to school with my brother. I was Taco, my brother was Sauce. What's up, taco? What's up, sauce? Taco sauce. (laughs) Every day, all the way through school. I didn't get mad. I didn't file a complaint. I just thought about it. I said, a taco is a crunchy shell filled with delicious ingredients. (laughs) How did Kenny know? One thing I know about comedy is you have to know the line. Everywhere you go across the country, you gotta know the line. Each ethnic group is different on what is sensitive and what's not sensitive. Up here, you guys are very cool. Go to the South, you should have a passport to go to the South. (laughs) Anybody from Biloxi, Mississippi? I got booked at a country western bar in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I knew the show was going to be in trouble when the guy booked me. He said, we want to book you. (laughs) That's the way he talks. We want to to book you for Cinco de Mayo. I was like, well, I'm booked already. He goes, hold up. I didn't tell you when the show was going to be. <laughs> We're doing it in February. <laughs> so I went, and I knew I was in trouble when I used the men's room and on the bathroom stall there was a swastika. Talk about a laxative. (laughs) (laughs) But we start the show and it's going great. We're having a good time. The people are laughing. And it only takes one because there's good and bad in every group. We know that. 
from the back of the club and the back of the bar, this good old boy screams out, Spear Chucker! <laughs> now, I've been called every ethnic slur you could possibly call a Mexican. You start calling me names from groups I don't even belong to, that's taking it too far. <laughs> There are people embarrassed in there. You're making us look dumber. <laughs> There's good and bad in every group. There were some good people after the show wanted to meet me. This one man never met a Mexican. He came up to me. He took his sheet off. <laughs> You're pretty funny for a Latin, though. That's Latino, man, Latino. <laughs> Latino. Chicano, you's a Chicano, ain't you? That's Chicano, man, Chicano. <laughs> Hispanic. <laughs> I finally cut him off, said, look, I don't care what you call me, just don't call me lazy. You will never see a Mexican on a street corner with the sign, we'll work for food. You might see us on that same corner selling food. <laughs> you give us a bite, that's an ice cream truck. <laughs> you give us a truck, that's a fruit stand. Mess around and give us an RV, well that's a restaurant. <laughs> Hey, where's your restaurant? Depends. <laughs> what kind of address is depends? <laughs> I'm very proud of the diversity of my culture. I had a friend who had never been to a Mexican restaurant and I, I took him there and he didn't understand the menu. And he started questioning everything. And I was bragging about how deep and diverse the Latino cultures are. So he goes, well, what's a taco? I said, that's a tortilla filled with meat and lettuce and cheese and sour cream. It's delicious. He goes, well, what's a burrito? I said, well, that's a tortilla filled with... <laughs> <laughs> What's a fajita? That's a, that's a do it yourself kit. <laughs> I believe we're equal, I believe we're different. Look how we define miracles. Each ethnic group defines miracles differently. White miracle is different than a black miracle, is different than a Latino miracle, different than a Chinese miracle or Asian miracle. White miracles, your miracles are usually because somebody was testing nature. You see it on the news. They were cross country skiing, got caught in a blizzard, barely made it out. Miracle. <laughs> That's definitely a white miracle right there. You will never hear that announcer say, Jose and Leroy were caught in a blizzard. <laughs> Jose and Leroy know that there's snow on the mountain. That's a message from the Lord. Stay off the mountain. <laughs> White miracle different than a black miracle. Black miracle is more like, and then the judge dropped the charges. <laughs> Brother, if you could see the people turning like this, they're like, is he laughing? <laughs> Darn it, Martha, I can't turn around to see if he's laughing. <laughs> they're gonna march, he's gonna make a march. <laughs> Black miracle different than Asian miracle, and Asian miracle is more like, today I drive to work. No one honk at me. <laughs> I 
And that's different than a Latino miracle. A Latino miracle is more like, uh, she's not pregnant. <laughs> One thing about comedy, like I said earlier, you gotta know the line. I, I perform in the South, the line is different than up here, different than California. Still gotta make them laugh. There's still comedy clubs in the South, like in South Carolina, where on a Friday night, it's for white folks. Saturday night, it's for black folks. Still gotta make them laugh, but you gotta know the line. Especially when the racial tensions are really high. I go to the South, here's the line when I got an all-white audience. Elvis Presley, Lady Die, Dale Earnhardt. That's the line right there. <laughs> you do one Dale Earnhardt joke, you hear banjos go off. <laughs> I was on BET, Black Entertainment Television, had me for nine seasons. I was the Mexican on BET. I know the line with my black brothers and sisters. Here's the line. Dr. Martin Luther King, President Obama, and hearing. No black folks very proud of the hearing. They'll let you know, I heard that. They're very proud. <laughs> it's okay, sir, you can laugh at that joke. Go to a big Latino concert, that's my people, I know the line. Here it is for a big Latino concert. The Raiders, Selena, and Jesus, in that order. <laughs> you could talk to the most hardcore gang-banging cholo out there, you say something wrong about the Lord, he'd be like, hey man, that's the Lord. He died for you and me, fool. Now go meet him. <laughs> Ma'am, it's not a real gun, it's okay. <laughs> she jumped. <laughs> She's like, he's so violent. <laughs> I'm gonna put it away, okay? Look right here, I'm gonna. <laughs> I saw her jump and almost messed me up. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I grew up in Berkeley, California, melting pot of the world. But when I travel, I tell people I come from the San Francisco Bay Area. Who's been to San Francisco? I tell people I'm from San Francisco right away, they go, I go, yep, earthquakes. <laughs> I think San Francisco is the greatest region on earth for one reason and one reason only. I don't care how big your event is, if you bring it to San Francisco, it will get topped by an everyday occurrence. <laughs> Follow me on this. You could bring a great event to San Francisco, it will get topped by something very San Francisco. A Couple years ago, it was Navy Fleet Week, Saturday afternoon. 400,000 people lined Fisherman's Wharf. I was there two hours early, because at three o'clock sharp, the Navy's Blue Angels are gonna come flying underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and swoop right past Fisherman's Wharf. 400,000 people, three o'clock sharp. I'm there two hours early. But at 2.59, he was six foot eight in high heels. hot pink shorts, a tube top, and a scarf, and he just came strutting by. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lord, what the shh. <laughs> you guys have been a great audience. Thank you very much. Good night, God bless you.